Hey, YouTube and Twitch. Let's do this. And hey, everybody, welcome to Squatch Talk. I'm Pat. How's everybody doing tonight? Glad you're here. Good to see everybody here. Um, we're just going to jump right in uh, and uh, and get to it here with our uh, our guest tonight. Um, what should I have pulled up here? Yeah, I do. Um, our guest tonight is uh, Mr. Bill Munns. Uh, who is a special effects artist, uh, worked on movies such as uh, Return of the Living Dead, Swamp Thing, Beastmaster, all movies I loved back in the day. Um, real, all real great movies. And, um, and of course, a uh, super analytic analyzer, um, expert analyzer of uh, the Patterson-Gimlin film. And uh, and uh, also a uh, author of uh, when uh, Roger when Roger met uh, Patty Roger and Bob met Patty right so uh, so yeah please welcome to the show um, 
My guest tonight, Mr. Bill Munns, how are you doing? Doing good. Thank you, Pat. Great, great. Thanks for being here. Appreciate you being here. Um, mm -hmm. so My let's, pleasure. Yeah, let's just jump right in. Uh, so, uh, yeah, is there anything you want to say? That I, I'll just let you have the floor for a minute. Uh, if you want to just kind of introduce yourself or if there's anything you have to add other than what I said, and uh, we'll go from there. Oh, I don't know. I think you covered the basics pretty well there. Um, yeah, I have a background in special makeup effects and creature stuff in Hollywood. Um, <clears throat> and jumped into the analysis of the Patterson-Gimlin film around 2008. Um, put a lot of time and effort into researching the film and, and analyzing whether or not the subject in it's a creature in an ape or person in an ape suit or whether it's something real, and then uh, put out my book a few years back that pretty much summed up all the research work. Yeah. Right, and, and that's that's the uh, When Roger Met Patty book. That Correct. I, you know, cited. Yeah. Um, it's interesting stuff. So I guess just real quick, like, you know, I, I'm sure you've been asked this a thousand times but so i mean your background especially your work in the 80s on those major productions you know like swamp thing and beastmaster you know mm -hmm. like you were you know you were doing professional stuff back then so we're talking about the early to mid 80s at what point did you think it important to bring your expertise to the table examining the pg film I'm curious. Um, it was actually around 2008. Um, I happened to be reading a, an article in the Los Angeles Times newspaper about a Bigfoot researcher who'd done a lot of research on the Patterson film. And there were things that were mentioned in there that made me think that this researcher and maybe others in the community had never really talked to somebody who actually had made tape suits for movies and TV work. So um, I decided to look into it thinking, well, maybe these guys need somebody who knows something about costumes and ape suits and all that to, uh, you know, just kind of clue them in to what really is important and what isn't. So in preparation for contacting some of the researchers and talking to them, I went to the Bigfoot forums on the internet and I was actually kind of surprised at how much photographic material was actually available. Uh, and I'd seen a few stills here and there, and I'd seen a few versions of the film on various TV shows. But I was really surprised at how much photographic material was available if you decide to delve into it. And so I started looking at all of this material and you know, saving everything to my computer and such and starting to converse with people in the forum and started building up this archive of photographic material related to the film. And uh, that's kind of what got me started on it. And once I got into that, I realized I could make a very substantial contribution to the research work. And that's kind of when I jumped into it, uh, head over heels. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's real interesting to me. And and I think that, Bill, I think that's an anomaly uh, for a an actual professional with a skill set and knowledge of things to sort of objectively stumble their way <laughs> into something, especially something so significant as the PG film. It's actually kind of a rare thing. Um, it's something that I absolutely... Yeah. I, I advocate part of the reason why I'm here is actually to reach out to professionals and, and not, you know, like and sort of entice them to be more open-minded about the, the phenomena itself. So, so I find your story fascinating because it, it kind of, it aligns in a weird way with uh, one of the things that I try and accomplish dealing with this subject. Yeah. 
Well, one of the things that I think is, is intriguing is the fact that once I got familiar with the film and got familiar with its history and all the prior research, I realized that none of the people who were recognized as prominent researchers, none of them had any background whatsoever in the business of making ape suits and gorilla costumes and creature costumes and effects. And also, none of them had a background in actual 16 millimeter film production, which I did when I was in college in the late 60s. Mm. And knowing about the film, the cameras, the lenses, the editing, the lab processing, all of that, uh, they were very relevant things that helped in analyzing the film, and no prior researcher had any background in that, so they really didn't have a clue about how that knowledge could contribute to an understanding of the film. Right. So uh, when I when I realized all that, I knew that I could definitely bring something very unique to the whole discussion, and I'm very confident that I was able to do that. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm glad that, again, that you were objectively willing to do it. Again, I I, I think you're an anomaly. Um so, so is it is it fair to say that you know, ten or fifteen years before that, there weren't people tugging on your shirt about Bigfoot, or, I mean, like you did you ever think much of the Bigfoot phenomena before you seemingly just kind of stumbled your way into it here? Well, I was interested in the whole cryptozoology thing. I have been since I was a kid, and I saw pictures of the footprints in the snow up in the Himalaya mountains, you know, that people attributed to what they then called the abominable snowman, but more today they call the Yeti. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, from the time I was maybe eight or nine years old, I have been fascinated by the subject of the whole cryptozoology thing. I didn't have any particular opinion on whether things were real or not, but, uh, you know, I'd read about it and I'd get look at the books and the occasional documentaries and you know, they've got the, the picture of Nessie and the Loch Ness and the stories about the dinosaurs in the Belgian Congo and, uh, you know, the Yeti in uh, the Himalayas and the Bigfoot in the Pacific Northwest. So I was kind of up on a lot of the cryptozoology ideas. I wasn't the whole hog buying into it. Um, I was curious, but I wasn't committed to, oh, yeah, this has got to be real. Um, you know, I realized that it could be either in some cases a hoax or in some cases uh, a natural phenomenon other than a creature or um, possibly misidentification of something else. So I was open to all possibilities, but definitely I was curious about the subject. Sure. And, and I mean, the fact the fact that you came from a, a background of uh let's just say creating creatures um, is, is ov obviously an artistic connection that you have there with the, that whole sort of that whole like subject line altogether, you know, whether it be fiction or, or real, right. It's uh, you, you had an artistic vision for, for those things, I'd say naturally. Well, basically, yeah. Um, with almost anything cryptozoological, especially Yetis and Bigfoots and even Loch Ness and Nesty and all that, um, a very common skeptical argument is simply to say it's, it's not real, it's a hoax. Well, you want to analyze whether or not something is a hoax, you need somebody who actually creates illusions, I don't want to call them hoaxes, but creates the illusion of a real creature. Um, from a professional standpoint. Right. So whether it's making a dinosaur or making an abominable snowman or making a Loch Ness monster or making, uh, you know, a Bigfoot or something like that, if you say that the evidence points to a hoax, you want to talk to somebody who has actually fabricated things for film or television work and in effect knows how to create an artificial one and pass it off as real. So you really need that perspective 
uh, to analyze it. And I found that a lot of the people who identify as skeptics, when they're constantly saying, oh, yeah, this is a hoax, that's a hoax, stuff like that, uh, they don't really understand how you accomplish a hoax. Uh, they just wanted to believe it was one. And they'd look for any kind of lame little excuse for to take yeah. it in their hopes on it. But they didn't really understand the process. I agree. So it was as yeah. much it was as much going into it to educate the skeptics about what can and cannot be done as it was to educate the people who are advocates that it's real. You know, I wanted both sides to really understand what we can do and what we can't do. And then maybe we can have a better intelligent dialogue about the subject. Yeah. Yes, and I I mean I agree with that a thousand percent because it is uh it's the nature of a skeptic to have a knee jerk reaction and let's just say, well, obviously it's a guy in a suit, right? That's the knee jerk yeah. reaction. And for a guy like me, yeah. um I'm not an expert, I'm not a special effects expert, I'm not at the level you are. But I can listen to people like you and other people and take into account other other scientific, you know, professional people. And I can condense that into an argument. But it's always best to hear the professional give the argument. But we also need to be able to fall back on professionals like yourself, which is why I'm begging the Bigfoot world that it, it's this common theme that I put out is that, no, we need more professionals. We don't need amateur, you know, campers or what, it, like, you know, amateur scientists, citizens. We need more professionals. It's great what people are doing with this subject. They're trying. They're trying to go out in the woods and get yeah. better evidence. I mean, that's what Roger and Bob were doing, right? So so you, oh, can't, yeah. you can't fault that, but you have to combine it with pro professional expertise in the right areas. So, so that's why I'm at. Absolutely. What I'm advocating for, big time. Sure. Yeah, it really is essential. If you want to get to a proper scientific conclusion, you really do need that. Absolutely. Yeah, and yeah, I agree. So let's um, uh, one of the first things I want to talk about with you, or ask you about, but be, uh, before before we uh, before I forget it, um, because you kind of mentioned it a little little while back is. So, um, Mr. Munns, uh, like where, what is the confidence level on the frames per second and the lens that was used? And what's, what's the confidence level on, on that and why? Um, unfortunately, those two are still um, not absolutely determined. Uh, let's take uh, the film speed frames per second. Um, the camera that Roger used is a model Kodak K100 camera, which is a spring wind camera. And the different speed settings that it had went from 16 frames a second up to 64 frames a second. But apparently, there's something that Kodak found out after they manufactured it and they set the low speed at 16 frames, um, they found out that there was a little bit of a flicker when it was being shown that was uh, a little bit disturbing. And so they actually kind of recalibrated the mechanism so that you, when it's set at 16, it's actually running at 18 frames per second. So that's actually the minimum the camera does. Now, there is a debate about whether it's at uh, 16 or 18 frames or whether it's at 24 frames per second. Um, I think a scientist, last name Greaves, or Greaves uh, particularly uh, brought up that point where he, he went, out, went so far as to say, well, if it's at one speed, it's a human. If it's another speed, it can't be a human. I don't know how he got at that, that conclusion, but anyways, that is an argument that's been very popular in the community. Um, and we've been trying to find ways of figuring out what the true speed of the camera was, whether it's 18 frames or 24 frames. Uh, but we, 
don't actually have any point of reference uh, that we can show that will tell us that uh, to a definitive degree. Uh, in all likelihood, the best thing would be to go to the footage before we see the Bigfoot creature, Patty. And the first 75 feet of that 100-foot roll Roger shot is either him or Bob Gimlin riding on a horse, walking through the woods, pulling a little white pack horse. <clears throat> and I think if you were to time the, the horse moving and compare it to real horses moving, at certain gallops, you might, uh, through that method, be able to calibrate the uh, camera taking speed. That might be an option. Uh, but yeah. anyways, on the, on the matter of the film speed, we actually don't know for certain. It's generally presumed that it probably was 18 frames per second. Uh, that is typical for film that's shot without sound. Uh, yeah. You just kind of conserve your film a little bit. You shoot at 24 frames, generally when you are going to be shooting with synchronized sound. So it's possible Roger could have been shooting at 16 frames, which would, in fact, be 18. Uh, that's the likely explanation, but we don't have a definitive fact on that. Uh, in terms of the lens on his camera, the standard lens is a 25 millimeter. Uh, there is a possibility that it's being explored that it might have been a 20 millimeter lens, a little bit more wide angle. Um, I haven't been able to nail this down uh, to a complete and final solution yet because I have some data that supports that it's a 25. I have some data that supports it's a 20. Obviously, some of that data has got to be wrong. So what I've been doing, uh, particularly the last couple of years, is trying to review all of the data that has been gathered to try to find out where the mistake is. But somewhere in all of the data that we have, there is a mistake. Mm. Uh, because all analysis should end up at one conclusion with the lens, not two different ones. So that is still a work in progress, determining you know which lens was on the camera. And that could help us, if it's finally determined, to actually determine how large she is. Uh, because we can use a, a lens formula that allows us to calculate her size in the picture. And if we know how far away she is, if we know how big uh, certain distances are there, uh, it is possible for us to calculate her height. But we do need to know the focal length of the lens. That's one of the four elements of the equation. Right. And so would that, would that lens be a fixed lens or a... A, a, a manual capability to focus. Do we know that? I'm um, sorry. Could you repeat the question? It would. Would that lens be a fixed lens or a manual focus lens? Oh, um, the 25 millimeter is a manual focusing lens. The 20 millimeter is a fixed focal length, so there's no focusing ring at all. Mm -hmm. um, when you shoot outdoors uh, in bright sunlight, anything from like five feet away to infinity is in sharp focus. It's a element of, of, of lens technology called the hyperfocal distance. And with a 20 millimeter, if you're shooting outdoors in sunlight, it's guaranteed to be in focus so you don't even worry about it. You just worry about the f-stop, which controls how much light uh, goes in through the lens to expose the film properly. But on the 25 millimeter, uh, that one does have a focusing ring on it because that lens was actually designed to allow users to shoot close-ups as close as like about a one foot and four inches. Real super tight close-up on a person or a small object or something. When you get that close, you do need uh, a focusing ring and a focusing element within the lens. So the 25 was a focusing, and the 20 millimeter that we're testing is a fixed focal length. Okay, and, and do you do you are you under the impression it was a fixed lens? If it's the 20, the 20 is a fixed lens. Yeah. Yeah. But for what we see in the film, either lens could have accomplished what we see. Right. 
because it was pretty much all distance. I mean, it was all distance shot. So, you know. Um, yeah, and outdoors in bright sunlight, if even if he had the focusing lens, if he set it at an F8 for the aperture, which would be appropriate for the Kodachrome film in bright sunlight, um, and he set the, the focusing ring properly, everything from like 10 feet away to infinity would be in perfectly sharp focus. That's how large that hyperfocal range gotcha. is uh, when you have bright sunlight and the lens is top down. So uh, Roger didn't have to worry about focusing on his subject. When he was out shooting, you know, he just set the lens, left it alone, set the f-stop for bright sunlight, and then he just started shooting whenever he wanted to, and it all came out pretty well. <laughs> yeah, yes, it did. Although, um, mm -hmm. I will admit, like, one of the biggest things, one of the most important things to ever happen to the film was was stabilization and uh in in digitizing that stabilization so it kind of lives forever right. you know in that realm because obviously film film decays um so digitizing it in a stabilized way has has proved to be uh the you know we've actually got our best look at patty in what here in the past you know 20 years or so compared to mm -hmm. I, I, I can't imagine what people were thinking in 1968 when they were seeing that for the first time. To me, it, it would have been inconclusive, to be honest with you. Yeah, the analysis technology at the time just wasn't up to dealing with it. And the only way you could see a print, uh, like a still picture, would be if you printed a still picture off of the film. Right. Uh, and printed it in a dark room the way you print any other still picture. You could make stills from that. Uh, but we didn't have any of the analysis technology back then that we have now. And certainly didn't have anything hooked up to a computer. Um, in the late 1960s, there was no such thing as computer graphics. And a computer did not have a monitor or a TV set hooked up to it. You know, those didn't even exist back then. Nobody even imagined that they ever would exist. So, uh, yeah, the technology has changed drastically, which has allowed us to preserve the film, mm -hmm. digitize it in its finest form, and, uh, you know, make sure that the, the, the digital version of it will be preserved, you know, forever, which is good. Yeah, and that, and the stabilization is like, that to me that was a game changer that was so important to be able to you know i mean roger was running after that thing like when you look at you look at the pg film in its raw form which almost no one ever does anymore uh mm -hmm. he he was literally running after it i mean it, it just like seemed like constant movement on his part so the camera's shaking you know um yeah he was in the beginning actually uh, yeah. The first couple of segments, um, he was running pretty briskly. And there's a lot more shaking and motion blur than there are clear frames in it. Yes. But once he got across the creek and up the other side and saw her still just calmly walking away, he ran forward to get as close as he thought he safely could. And then he planted himself on the ground as solid as could be, held the camera absolutely solid. And that's when he filmed where she looked back at the camera, the look back sequence. Yeah, the look back. When yeah. he was filming that, he was mm -hmm. not moving around at all, which is why that segment is so sharp relative to the beginning segment. Uh, then he, after she continued to walk away, he chased again, moved a little further forward and was trying to shoot her again. But those ending segments are a little bit shaky or wavy with the camera moving around. Because Roger was kind of moving, trying to get a good position. But that look back right in the middle of the film is dead on sharp because he was holding steady when he was filming it, which is excellent. Yeah, it's a double-edged sword because that it's also, uh, you know, the other side of that says, oh, how convenient. The money shot was the most still part. <laughs> Right, you know the money. Well, shot. Actually, funny. Some skeptics go the opposite, and they say that Roger 
deliberately was shaking the camera to hide flaws in his costume actor. Uh, but then that's completely defeated when you realize that he, when he's filming the best sequence, it shows her from the back to side and actually looking toward camera to see her face in the front of her chest. Uh, that's when he is holding the camera the steadiest to get the clearest possible shot um, so that he can observe and study the anatomy and subject. So if there were any flaws, if it was a costume and there were flaws in it, that would have been the time he should have been shaking it like crazy So you, to hide any apparent flaws. But he's holding it rock steady, which means he really did want to preserve the most accurate record of what he was seeing. Yeah, uh, so he did that very well, actually. I agree, um, but you know, it's a the you know how this goes, Bill. There's always there's always opinions, you know, and it, it goes from knee jerk to it, you know. There's some well thought out skeptical opinions, and I don't I don't mind that as long as they're well thought out. It's the knee jerk stuff that yeah, it's hard to. It's hard to deal with sometimes. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, it is. Um, yeah. you know, they really don't know what they're talking about. And that's why uh, they just uh, yeah. they, just, they just kind of muddy the whole dialogue uh, yeah. without really contributing anything. Which is, well, uh, that's that's why you got to put them in their place as a professional, <laughs> right? Yep. Yeah. Um. So I want to talk. <clears throat> I'm sorry. My voice is cracking tonight. I get, I was, I've been a little under the weather. It's not, uh, it's not, uh, COVID related, but, uh, um, so my voice cracks. Everybody, I'm sorry. I apologize. I'm kind of losing my voice, actually. I want to talk about Bob. Um, and there's a couple of things I want to talk about Bob. Um, it, it certainly his relation in the uh, three-dimensional space there. Um, and we'll talk about that, too, because you came up with, uh, just to lay the groundwork, uh, you know, uh, Bill came up with a great 3D computer-animated, like, sort of overview of the entire um, area there, the bluff, the whole Bluff Creek area where that happened, which was... God looks like it was about the size of almost two football fields, which blew me away. By the way, I was like, I didn't realize it's so big because you, you yeah, only it actually is that. much bigger than a football field. Yeah, yeah, it's almost. I mean, in the Patterson Gimlin film, I it's almost one dimensional, you know, because mm -hmm. because like well, you said, photography does that. Yeah, because of the the it, it compresses foreground and background. And yeah. if you don't have the proper perspective on it, uh, it can seem much smaller, much tighter uh, than it actually is. That's a simple that reality was, of photography. That was three-dimensional form and translating yeah. it into a two-dimensional image. That was uh, Yeah, the Bluff Creek area was actually a very large open expanse, well bigger than a football field. Well, yeah. So, I, yeah, it was I, actually a pretty big, wide open area. Yeah, I'd say... From I mean, if your recreation was accurate, it's it's almost every bit of two football fields, you know, at least oh, joined yeah. together at some point, right? Um, but yeah, that one dimensional, like you said about the focus, if everything's in good focus, then it almost looks one dimensional because the tree that's let's say two hundred feet behind Patty. You can see that tree. You can almost identify it. You know what I mean? It's like, um, yeah. So I, but uh, first of all, I want to talk about Bob. And I know, yeah. I know that you're like, uh, well, you know Bob. I mean, you've met Bob. You've been around Bob. And uh, yeah. So, so I, I'm just going to ask this question, just you know, fair and outright. Is there any way that Bob Gimlin? in 2022 is hoaxing us or somehow was fooled that day by a guy in a suit? Uh, well, one, he's not hoaxing anybody. Bob's absolutely sincere in what he experienced, 
what he saw, what he testifies to. Uh, so 100%, he believes what he saw is something real, and mm-hmm. he knows for certainty that he was not involved in any kind of hoax or trickery or anything like that. Um, it has been questioned, could Roger have pulled a fast one on Bob? And if you ever worked on a film, worked with somebody in a costume, uh, tried to film something, if you've ever actually been on a set, seen how complicated it actually is when you're trying to create a fictional film. Uh, there's just no way you could pull that off and have a witness right beside you who thought everything was real. You know, there's just no way in the world because if you've got a guy in a costume running around uh, like crazy, um, you've got to try to give him your attention to the him. You got to cue him when to start, tell him when to stop, tell him you know, oh, you're walking the wrong way. You got to go this way, that way, or whatever. Uh, there's no way you can do any of that and have somebody on the set who doesn't know that it's being fake. So the idea that anyone could fake it and Bob wouldn't know about it is is just, you know, impossible. Uh, Not to mention, not to mention the fact that Bob was armed. (laughs) (laughs) That is another thing. Yeah. Yeah. He had a 30 odd six loaded and ready to go. And, uh, the dumbest thing in the world anyone could ever do is put someone into a realistic creature costume, take them out in the woods, and then have a person who doesn't know it's all fake and put a rifle in their hand. I mean, that is just, <laughs> that's beyond insane. It's, and, uh, it's, nobody more, would ever do anything. it's more unrealistic than an undiscovered upright walking hominin. I'll say that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, okay. I, I mean, I just wanted to state that for the record because I agree. Like, there's no way Bob was fooled, which which would mean that if it were hoax, he was in on it. You know, which that to right. me, that to me is like like so extremely uh, extremely unlikely. Like, pretty much n- virtual zero chance that's the case. Um. Yeah. So therefore, what, um, what was Bob's role in that? If you could describe it, because I know I actually saw a video today I'd never seen before, which was Bob sitting down at the computer with you. Meldrum was there. Uh, I, I believe Barackman was there, and you guys were kind of going over what you know the. Uh, the whole 3D uh, computer modeling layout, and he was talking about it, and then you you showed it to him. It was it, it was actually really interesting. So, uh, so what was Bob's role in that, as far as best as you could tell? Um, well, obviously, when Roger was going on his expeditions, he needed someone to assist him. I mean, there was more than he could do alone, and. Um, when he found out there was a trackway in Northern California, he found that out in August of 67, Rene Hinden and John Green were investigating. He decided his next trip would be to Northern California. Well, um, he had been down in California, I think once or twice before. He had some vague familiarity with the area, and he knew that uh, there weren't that many roads and that uh, they could take a vehicle on. So he decided that he wanted to pack in on horseback, and he was going to need someone to go with him who was a very experienced horseman who could supervise handling the horses, feeding them, um, getting them saddled up, getting them unsaddled, the whole thing like that, who had a truck that would carry horses in it, which Bob had access to. and. so he needed somebody to assist him with that, as well as just the general exploring and the general camping activity out in the wilderness. So he asked Bob to come along, mainly as his assistant, 
with those functions in mind, uh, maintaining the horses, keeping track of them, taking care of them, everything like that. Um, so that was actually Pop's primary role there. And Roger was kind of the one who was deciding, okay, let's go here today. Let's explore this. Uh, let's go up there, down there. Uh, and he had, Roger had the camera in his saddlebag of his horse ready to go, just in case they encountered something interesting that he wanted to film. So that's kind of how they divided the whole thing up. Now, uh, they do explain in an interview shortly after the event that they talked it over in advance. And, the, I mean, obviously, Bob knew that Roger was looking for Bigfoot or evidence of Bigfoot because of the trackway. That's the reason they went down there. Um, so they talked about, hypothetically, if we encounter one, what are we going to do? And they had agreed that even though Rod, um, Bob's got the, the rifle with him at all times, they had agreed they will not try to shoot it unless they feel their lives are threatened. Mm. You know, so if there is no right. threat to their physical being, they will not take the shot and, and you know try to take it down. So that was discussed and agreed in advance by the two of them. So even though uh, when Roger was chasing after Patty with the camera, Bob was still on horseback and kind of riding at his side, didn't want to get in front of him, didn't want to get into the frame. But he was kind of riding beside him, and he had his rifle out, and he was ready to go watching it uh, to see if it was going to turn around and charge and come at him and maybe uh, threaten him. If so, he would have taken the shot uh, to protect Roger or protect himself. Uh, but uh, she just kept walking away, and so they let her do so. So you you have a good understanding of Bob's movements in that uh, in the let's let's say the three D recreation. Do you, you have that roughly? Well, actually, uh, nowhere near as accurately as we can calculate Rogers. Um, the thing is, Roger was carrying the camera, okay. And if you have a camera moving through a three dimensional space, you can actually calculate where all of these three-dimensional objects are in different frames from different camera positions. And you can not only reconstruct the environment in 3D correctly, but you can calculate where the camera is all the way through, going through there. So right. once you did. the 3D environment was constructed, the camera was determined exactly where the camera was, Right. And where the camera is is where Roger is. So we could track Roger's movement really right down to uh, a very high level of precision. But because Bob wasn't holding the camera, and he's not seen in the film, we cannot calculate his position with anywhere near as much accuracy. We can only pretty much go by his description. Yeah, of what he which he did. Um, so again, from that video I watched, I'm sure you remember this when this happened, when Bob was there and Meldrum was there and you had the computer, you know, out the 3d and it was being filmed. Um, uh, so at that point, what I remember is, uh, after you kind of played the whole thing through, then Bob, Bob was, uh, uh he was, uh, he seemed a little better understanding of his own relation in that. And it seemed to be a, a, a sort of a left, left to the Roger, left to Roger's flank and a, around towards, you know, sort of where her original uh, path was there, you know, and that's where he, I guess yeah. he, dis, he dismounted up there um, just up to the upper left. It, it, from your perspective, where you're showing the perspective of the 3d, um, upper yeah. left of the uh, the log jams and all that stuff, uh, and all the debris, um, right? And so he he kind of seemed comfortable saying, "Well, this is you know, I was up here." And I thought I thought that was really interesting because I I never could wrap my head or visualize where Bob was in this whole event until I saw that video uh -huh. today. To be honest with you, yeah. 
yeah, what it did is it actually clarified his own memory. Yeah. Uh, when he when he'd ask him and he'd try to visualize it in his mind, um, it was a little difficult for him to recall some of the details. When he actually saw the event visualized in the computer with Roger and with Patty and the environment and everything. It, uh, it it really refreshed his memory in a way that, okay, when Roger was here, I was over here. And when Roger ran up to there, I went over to there. And it allowed him to really clarify in his mind what his movements were. So uh, that was certainly one of the benefits of doing the computer visualization. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. It's very interesting. Um, I I uh, I recommend everybody check that out. Uh, I will try and link it. I can only link it after the fact. I I actually didn't think to link that in the description tonight. Uh, but if I mean, if you just go on YouTube and search Bill Munns, you know Bill Munns and Bob Gimlin, you know something like that, uh, you'll you'll find that video. You'll come across it, and it, it's really interesting to see Bob, you know looking at the site again in a way that he uh, perspective that he it, it makes sense to him even all those years later because he he seemed to understand yeah. where every you know where everything was you know like yeah. um and how the how the creek yeah. ran and and where even where it ran would continue running off screen and um he was he was really like recalling some things that i i i agree that it got Somehow it got stimulated that recall in him, you know, because mm -hmm. you're able to right. visualize it, which is very uh, visual. Visualization is extremely important, you know. Um, sure. Obviously, uh, so yeah, that's it, that's interesting. I I encourage everybody to check that out. Um, I'll try I'll I'll try and add it to the description later. Um, that video because it's a it's a good one. Um, so let's talk about her size, Patty's size. Um, yeah. And I guess, again, that kind of falls back on the frames per second and the lens. But um, like other experts, because it, it's not just you, you know, other experts like Ken Walker. Ken Walker yeah. thinks that she was about six foot eight, I believe. Uh, but I think the most common, most common height that's come out of everybody, everyone who's analyzed this in an objective way is somewhere between seven, two and seven, six. But. Uh, yeah, several people have come to that conclusion. Uh, an image analyst named Jeff Glickman, who uh, worked with uh, uh, Peter Byrne, um, uh, or Byrne, I'm sorry. Um, mm. They did a, a fairly comprehensive analysis. He was comparing uh, the pictures of her to known elements of the landscape that could be measured and uh, uh, documented. Uh, he came up with a conclusion in that range. Uh, a few other people have done various analysis where they similarly do. Uh, the problem there is an alternate form of an analyzing your height. It's commonly called the foot as ruler method, where we know the trackway that was there and the casts were taken. We know those footprints were 14 and a half inches long. And there are two frames of Batty in the early part of it where her foot is being raised up to step forward, and it's literally pointing straight down at the ground, which means we are seeing the sole of her foot. And what people have done for this foot is ruler height calculation is they take the 14 and a half inches of the known footprint, they compare it to the bottom of the foot they see in that picture, and then they try to reconstruct how tall Patty would be if she were standing up straight, not kind of lean forward and the legs bent a little bit. They kind of straighten her out, stand her upright, and then they see how many of those 14 and a half footprints uh, would it take to get to the top of her head from the bottom of her foot. 
and those methods used to come in like between five foot ten and six foot two. So you've got diverging theories of how uh, how to calculate her height. I think the lens formula will be the most definitive method, but it depends on knowing the lens, and because we haven't absolutely verified the lens yet, uh, we can't you know, crunch the numbers through the lens formula to get a determination that way. So, yeah, there's two schools of thought. One, the foot is ruler. They say she's like 5'10 to 6'2". And then there's some of the other analysis done by some of the people comparing her to elements in the background or comparing her to when Jim McLaren walked the same path the following summer and John Green filmed him. Uh, and they compared Jim's height to Patty. Uh, and we know Jim's like six foot four and a half, six foot five, thereabouts. Um, mm-hmm. So they try to compare her to him and they say, yeah, Patty's a little taller than Jim. Maybe she's about six eight. So those are some of the ways that have been attempted to calculate her height, but none of those particular methods has actually reached the point where we can say conclusively, this is the conclusion. She is this tall, period. End of discussion. We have, we're not quite there yet. Obviously, uh, we're still working on that. Yeah, and, and to be honest with you, Bill, I'm not I'm not sure we'll get there. You know, it's uh um I know there's still things that need to be done and there's still things to explore about that film, but uh you know, it's it, it you know, it's not going to be analyzed for probably I mean, another 20 years, I would you know what I mean? Like we're probably Yeah, there are I mean, there are things we can still pull out of the film and more analysis can be done, but we have done really pretty much the, the lion's share of what can be analyzed from the film. Yeah. yeah, so right now we're just kind of tying up loose ends, basically. Yeah, and it's still, like, obviously it's not enough to go to uh, any major university and start turning heads, you know, after 54 years. Un- unfortunately, like, I say that yeah. The word unfortunately, you know, um, mm-hmm. but it's still, it's a fascinating film. I mean, to me, I know what I'm looking at there. I mean, I know what I'm not looking at. I'm not looking at a guy in a suit. Like, I know that right. 100%, 100%. A lot of people like to put percentages on that. They'll go, oh, I'm 60, 40, 70, 30, 98, 2, right? No, I'm 100%. I know what I don't see there. I don't see a guy in a suit. Yeah, I'm 100% also. Yeah, so therefore... There's no doubt. Yeah, there, therefore, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if, it, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, man, it's a undiscovered hominin. Um, mm-hmm. But we're not there yet. Um Although I'll tell you this, you you might find this interesting. I, I've said this on the show many times, so uh, I'll, but I'll say it again for your benefit, Bill. I had a discussion on air with a young primatologist, a, a, a female primatologist, very intelligent. She's in her twenties, smart, on top of her game, and she was willing to talk to me about the Bigfoot phenomena on like on air live. Right. And she, yeah. fu- she fully admitted on air. She said it, it is a strange film, but it's not enough for me to accept. There's an unright, uh, uh, upright walking, you know, hominin in North America, but she fully admitted as a young, young person who is a professional primatologist. Yeah fully admitted it's a strange film that she can't wrap her head around i found that a really good sign of like sort of uh the old guard is like long gone you know and and the new people yeah that's actually in in the anthropology sciences that's actually a progressive point of view and it's an admirable one uh because unfortunately some of the old guard uh just dismiss it out of hand. It's, ah, it's a fake. Don't bother me. Don't waste my time. 
But if you say, okay, how do we know it's a fake? Who proved it's a fake? I mean, where is the rigorous proof based on evidence that we can read and study and see who proved it, when did they prove it, how did they prove it, and they just draw a blank? It's, it's never been it's proved. not there because there no. isn't any proof. Nothing. Ever. No, and you... It you, shows it's a hope. Oh, yeah. And you, you use the word rigorous? It, it doesn't even come close. Like, that that's not even a... That's not even a proper word to use with... Uh, Oh, it's a guy in a suit, you know, like, no. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah, I know. A, a, a lot of it is, uh, honestly, a lot of it is just people who are bluffing. They, they, they say, I know, it's just a guy in a costume didn't fool me for a second. I mean, it's not even worth your time. They're bluffing. They want to sound like they're authoritative. They want to sound like they know what's really going on. But the truth is, it scares them. They don't want to talk about it. I agree. So they bluff, and they try to shut down the conversation that way. But when they say that, it's a bluff. It's not based on that. I agree. I agree. And uh, I've had to deal with that. I deal with skeptics. Uh, so um, so I, I, I will talk to skeptics online, like in discussions like this. So live on-air discussions. I've even done a, a few debates you know, uh, online debates. And uh, so, yeah, pretty much whenever I, you know, default to the uh, Patterson-Gimlin film, which unfortunately is the best piece of evidence I think we have. Um, I say we. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't, cl- I'm not, I'm not trying to claim uh, you and I are we. I'm just saying like the, the, the people who no, understand yeah, we, that. We is the collective population of, of people yeah. The world actually. who understand yeah, it is uh, by far and away the who best evidence yeah. that exists. Yeah, who the people who understand the phenomena is 100 percent real, uh, re- regardless of what it is, right? Um, but you know that's the best yeah. piece of evidence that we have in 54 years, which is why number one, it's still relevant, and it is, and number two. Sucks that we don't have anything better in that amount of time. It's like, again, it's a double-edged sword, you know? So. Yes, exactly. um, But let's talk. um, So uh, if if you would, Bill, like, give me, maybe give me a rundown on the proportions. Because that's, again, that's one of the things I, I always default to. And it's it it's not something a skeptic can knee jerk debunk in any way. And again, there's been no rigorous uh, debunking of the proportions of that Patty had, regardless of her size. Mm-hmm. Let, let's just say she was six yeah. foot. Those proportions yeah. seem way off. If you could uh, talk about that for a minute, that'd be great. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, um, in terms of anatomical proportions, they definitely are very strange. Uh, one, uh, the, looking at just her basic torso or gross anatomy, uh, she has a relatively long torso from, say, neck down to the base of the pelvic area. Uh, she has very long arms, but she has curiously very short legs. Now, most humans have Longer legs, shorter torso, shorter arms. Uh, so right off the bat, that proportion's off. Uh, in humans, the only people who have the longer torso, longer arms, shorter legs, most of those people actually are uh, very, very short people, a very, very small stature, like five feet or under. And they're people who only live in the very northernmost climates like in Iceland or in northern Canada near the Arctic Circle and such, uh, the Inuit people or the Sami people of Lapland, um, those people do have a body proportion closer to that. But they're the exception to the, to the human form, and they're very small people. The taller people invariably get their height from longer legs, and Patty's legs are actually very short relative to her torso and her arms. So right off the bat, that's way off. 
Uh, the torso itself is quite massive, uh, building up to quite a bit of mass in the shoulder area, uh, and the trapezius muscles that come up uh, top of the shoulder going into the cranium, and the back muscles and such, uh, all very, very powerfully built. But another very curious thing about her is that for the size of the torso, size of the arms, the legs, and everything else, she has a very, very small head. And that's significant because if we try to make a human look more like an ape, we can't subtract from the human's head. We can only add in creating a mask or a costume or something like that. Uh, so if you want to take a human head and try to make it look more ape-like, you have to add to it. You have to add more to the front of the face to pull the muzzle out, add more to the brow area to pull that out. So that from the brow going back into the cranium kind of looks like it's sloping back. You have to kind of put a little more on the back end of the skull. You have to build everything much bigger. So whenever you, somebody does an ape costume for human to wear, the head ends up bigger than it should be, scaled correctly. Uh, that's just an elemental flaw to basically all ape suits, chimpanzee, gorilla costumes, whatever. Well, Patty's head is remarkably small relative to her body, which is one of the things that actually shows us why it isn't a human with just a prosthetics or a face mask or anything to look more like her, because we can't make that head shape and get it to fit on a human head so it functions correctly so the person can see out of the eyes and everything else, and keep it that small. Almost invariably, if we want to make a head mask, it's going to be built up bigger than that. So the, the head proportion is actually one of the strongest arguments for why she is something biologically real, she's not a human, in a costume and a mask. Uh, but her proportions are very, very unusual. You know, the, what I mentioned about the leg, torso, and the arms, uh, the overall massiveness of the form. Uh, the smallness of the head, everything about it, uh, are very definitely unusual anatomical features that are quite different than modern human form, although oddly they're very, very closely resembling an ancestral human form. If you go back about a million three hundred thousand years ago, there's one of our human ancestors called Paranthropus boisei, um, and the boisei skull and the body that we know from various skeletal remains that have been located, uh, they have a body that's actually well-proportioned, similar to hers, and a head that's almost a perfect match for her. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very legitimate uh, argument to say this could be a feral human form derived from this human ancestor breath of the which still existed today and has grown larger but kept all the proportion. So that's actually a very credible theory to explain the origins of this particular creature, if you want to call it that. Uh, right. no, if sure. she is in fact real, which we of course believe, um, where did she come from? How did she evolve? Is she an ape? Is she a human? My bet would be on her being related to the Parenthesis Boise uh, hominid. Right. And the, the, uh, the fossils we have of Boise Eye from way back when, uh, they were, Boise Eye was, was smaller, right? you know, but... Yeah, she was, a, the Boise Eye were about, I think, maybe four feet tall, four and a half feet tall. So they were smaller, yes. Uh, but there is a, a biological rule that... <laughs> Um, a lot of, of life forms that are in warmer environments, like equatorial regions, tend to be smaller, and the same specimen living in an Arctic or a very high northern clime where it's much colder tend to be much bigger. Uh, we look at bears in tropical environments compared to the polar bear and the Kodiak bear, you know. Uh, oh, yeah. You look at the little elephant falcon eerie that was like three yeah. feet tall in Italy compared to the 12 to 15 foot tall mammoths 
in the ice age. So uh, inhabiting yeah. a colder climate does tend to encourage evolution of a larger form mm -hmm. of the same creature. Yeah, la latitude matters. <laughs> That's for sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. I live in uh I live in Georgia and the bears we have here eh, 150 pounds. You know, maybe 200 pounder. That's big. Yeah. yeah. Uh that's nothing compared to like uh you know, Canada, Grizzly or, or Kodiak. like upper, yeah. like upper latitudes of North, North America, like even black, yeah. and I'm talking black bear. I'm not even talking grizzly bear. You know, it's like, yeah. Yeah. So, even the black bears themselves. Yeah. They're a lot bigger. Yeah. So that's, that's happening. I've been reading something on the internet of one that's like a 500 pound black bear who's breaking into houses somewhere. Right. Um, yeah. They can get pretty big, but as you that's say, huge. yeah, down in the lower, more tropical or temperate uh, climates, oh, yeah. they're definitely smaller. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. I mean, if I saw a five hundred pound black bear in Georgia, I would. I'd shoot. I'd shoot it in the head. Like, I'd, <laughs> like you, yeah. Like you don't belong here. Like you're you're a monster. Like get out of here. Um, yeah, that's a decent sized bear. Yeah, and uh, again, I think the last black black bear that I I I encountered was. I don't know, 150 pounds, maybe, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. 180, maybe. So, like, that's par for the course around here. So, latitude matters, which means uh, you're talking, you know, a million years also to evolve and change and move, right. you know, be on the move. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good candidate, too. You know, I'm, I'm open to other candidates, but... It would almost have to be something like that, you know. It's like the the fossil record. Well, number one, the fossil record's incomplete, so we don't we don't know yep. what we don't know. But what we do know are things that are very similar, you know, um, including yep. including Gigantopithecus. Although I I don't think that's a good candidate personally, but it does show how big primates can be. And Gigantopithecus yeah. was, was was certainly a huge primate that was here oh, yeah, no question. not that long ago. you you know, relatively speaking, you know, um, yeah. on the scale. Um, I think the youngest fossil evidence is a few hundred thousand years ago to a million um, for Gigantopithecus, um, but uh, yeah, they show the scale a primate can achieve. Definitely. Yeah. That's the value of making comparisons. I don't think that they're the likely candidate for uh, what we commonly call Sasquatch, though, mm -hmm. uh, because they're they're actually much closer to the orangutan lineage. Yeah, they're in that um, branch. Yeah. And yeah. based on Patty's bipedalism, uh, she's so close to human in terms of general posture and locomotion that um, I think she'd almost invariably have to be somehow connected to the hominid family tree. I agree. I mean, it, it's either that or they're from planet Hairtron. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> like, that's where I'm at. It's like, okay, guys, it's one of those two things. Like there's mm -hmm. like all this, all this in between stuff, you know? Yeah. They're, they're coming here on their spaceships from planet Hairtron or, they're just an undiscovered hominin, you know? Like, yeah. I, I just don't know where to go in between all that, you know? Uh, because what, you know, what I know is not a guy in a suit on that film, the PG film, back to that. Um, that thing just kind of got up and walked away. Like, all right, uh, you're here. I, I don't want to be around you. I'm leaving. That's yeah, that's, exactly. that's what happened. And uh -huh. it, it didn't run. It did. It it did at some point. Sort of. Uh, she appeared to pick up her pace a little bit, if you will. But she wasn't running. She was just like, I don't want to have anything to do with you. I'm out of here. And that's a that's a yeah exactly. That's the behavior of a earthbound animal, as far as I'm concerned. It, you know? Yeah, exactly. And uh, I was going to go somewhere with that, and I just lost my train of thought. But uh, 
So I don't know, Bill, like uh, just your opinion. Just I'm, I'm going to pick your brain. Do you think it was like dumb luck that that happened with them, with Roger and Bob? I mean, was it a perfect storm? I mean, was there anything that you think in your head, just your own opinion, that, get you know, was advantageous or was it just a combination of things? Um, really, it's just the simple reality that if you want to try and find some kind of a mysterious creature that is suspected to exist, but you're not sure about it, um, the best way to simply increase pure probability that you might actually encounter it and might have an opportunity to film or photograph it is you just plain have to get out into what is believed to be its territory and you just have to go out day after day after day all day long sun up sundown and just keep wandering around um the sheer amount of time invested in that uh is what will make you likely to come across evidence of such it's kind of the same thing you know uh, that the giant squid um, we, we've known they've existed for 150, 200 years. However, you know, parts of the squids would wash up on the beach and, uh, such like that. And there was actual bodies that science could count on, but nobody had ever actually seen one alive, healthy swimming around in the water. And, uh, who's going to see a giant squid in the water? Well, it's the person who's going to get a, remote camera and send it down a couple of thousand feet into the water and just keep filming everything left right that's the one who's going to finally come up with an image of a giant squid and some people did i think it was maybe i don't know eight or ten years ago doug no doug some ocean explorers finally had mm. the first ever footage of a giant squid uh, which was swimming away from their camera, but still was nice, clear footage of a very big specimen. And uh, they got it because they just plain were exploring more than the average person would. Uh, Roger and Bob were doing the same thing. They were out in the woods day after day, week after week, exploring. So the probability, the simple probability of them encountering something uh, is much greater than practically anybody else who isn't out in the forest for weeks at a time, day in, day out. It's all day, sun up, sun down. That's your simple probability. You get out there in the environment, you just keep looking around, you are more likely to encounter something. So Roger was just playing the odds in that respect, and he won. He won the photographic lottery, you might say. <laughs> Yeah, I know. And, uh, and, you know, they, yeah, it's, it, almost, uh, that's why I say it was just a, a perfect storm. Like in my head, even though they were trying, I mean, they were out there for weeks. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how much they were trying to film one. It almost seemed like Roger, he wanted a lot of B roll footage. He was hoping to find tracks. You know, and yeah, and that's it, actually why he went there. He yeah, was maybe, expecting to find footprints. Maybe at some point, and maybe some broken twigs or twig structures. But yeah, he actually went there expecting to find footprints. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, he, in his in his dream, he was hoping to see one, but he was going there expecting to find footprints. Right? Yeah. Exactly. So, even if they came up with a plan, it was just, I guess, for the sake of. Well, we should have a plan just in case, right? Which is smart. Yeah. Because obviously he's got a camera. He's like, oh, I'd love to film one. That would be perfect. But it, it seemed like his intention was to shoot B-roll and and find tracks. Um, because he was yeah. trying to make he was trying to make a documentary, you know. Um, Correct. Yeah. And so I don't know, it just uh it's one of those things. It's like, I don't know, did the horses have a role? Like, is it because they were on horseback? Should we, 
Like, should people be out there, like, in my mind, Bill, like, I'm just, I'm sort of, like, opining here. In my mind, I'm like, well, should we be, you know, should people, researchers, be on horseback more? You know, like, but then again, it, that was a unique area, so you can't do that everywhere, you know? It's like, I don't yeah. know. It, 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 well, I, actually, generally speaking, if you're on horseback riding around in the woods, you're making a fair amount of noise. And if something's nearby, before you see it, it probably would hear the noise and move a little further away, so you wouldn't see it. But Bob and Roger had the rather remarkable situation that they're riding right alongside a very noisy creek, yep. which drowns out a lot of noise. And there was a big log jam on the bank of the creek that she was behind. So they just happened to be in an excellent place where they could get close without being heard or without being seen, which was, you might say, as you like to say, the perfect storm. Yeah. It was just the right place. Had they been somewhere else in the wood, not close to the stream, uh, Patty might have walked away and they never saw her. But because she didn't know they were approaching, uh, that's really what the remarkable coincidence that put them in such close proximity there. Yeah, I mean, obviously gave them an advantage. Like, these things don't get yeah. trapped out. That's the thing. That's the weird thing about the PG film is that these things do not get just trapped out in the open or caught, I'll say. Caught in the wide open like that. That's not a typical yeah. encounter story. Like, they're always... Right. They seem to always be in control of the situation. And that's the amazing thing about the PG film is that it appeared, it appears that Patty got caught with her pants down, you know, literally, and uh yeah. and had a decision to make. Uh, am, am I gonna kill these two guys or am I gonna walk away? And she just walked away, you know. Yeah. Uh kind of you know it's just kind of a weird situation altogether because uh, it, it it doesn't match up to most encounters yeah and that, that's the irony yeah, of it it's definitely it's, unusual it's encounter. yeah and the, these guys filmed it and again that's that's why i kind of go back to the perfect storm um which, you know, is what it is. Uh, I mean, I just, I, I like to wrap my head around that kind of understand, trying to understand it better, yeah. basically. Um, yeah. Because I, I know what I'm looking at. I know what I'm not looking at. And I know what I'm looking at. So, um, yeah. but that was a long time ago, Bill. I mean, 54 years. What can we do better now, do you think? Well, there is a lot of new technology that is being applied to the search, which I think is excellent. Um, the whole issue of touch DNA, I think, has tremendous promise. Um, the other thing, though, is that um, it's possible with new computer technology, particularly artificial intelligence and deep learning capabilities, um, you could set up a number of audio and video um, devices that literally just look all day, all night at the forest or listen to it in, in different locations. And the problem with that is if the, the, you've got like 100 cameras and they're running 24-7 and 100 sound recorders running 24-7, you have so much data, you're probably never going to be able to even get through it. But if we can apply artificial intelligence and deep learning technology, that's exactly the kind of technology that can wade through, you know, just tons and tons of this audio and video data and possibly find the proverbial needle in the haystack uh, from all of this and actually find the things that would uh, be supportive of it. So I'm hoping mm. that some of that new technology can be applied to the search. I think it'll be very beneficial. And I think the whole touch DNA issue is uh, definitely going to be yielding some good results pretty soon. 
it, I agree on both fronts. There, there's some promising things in the works with DNA that I, I'm pervy to myself. Um, probably some of this, we're probably talking about some of the same stuff. Uh, but I, I agree with you 100%. If you're going to put static devices out in the woods that are meant to just be there, live there, and do their thing statically, right? Then mm -hmm. you do it in great numbers. And I agree, you use software, use software to find those gems, not people. Because, I mean, who the heck wants to... Who the heck wants to listen to 400 hours of audio waiting for that, you know, whatever, right? <laughs> you know, and, and it, yeah. it may, it, you hear that whatever, it, and to your ear, it might be inconclusive. I don't, was that a coyote? I don't know. So you're waste, literally wasting yeah. your life away. So I agree yeah. that, so you train, that yeah. yeah. You train a machine to recognize certain things. And then right. turn the machine loose, going through all the data, and it'll find it much, much better. So you can find anything that sounds like an anomaly sound, mm -hmm. and then you can filter out owls, you can filter out coyotes, you can filter out, you know, whatever else uh, that's making a sound, and you can filter all those out. And then you have just a few anomalies left. Same with the video, you can uh, identify or set up the program so it looks for changes in the structure of what it's seeing that are indicative of a live animal moving as opposed to just the environment or the trees swaying in the breeze or whatever like that. And then it can pull out the footage that actually has live animals. Then you can program what type of a live animal, standing on two feet, walking on four, flying on wings or whatever, filter it out even more. And the machine can actually narrow it down wonderfully, you know, it's properly set up and you have the data. So I'm I'm really hoping there will be a lot more work in that regard. I think it'll definitely yield results. Yeah, well, I yeah, I, I agree that a hundred percent that if if that stuff's gonna be put out there in a in all in any kind of scale, that the best way to analyze it is with software. Or, or AI, like, you know, um, but, uh, okay. So before I move on and there's, there's a couple of things I want to touch on before we go, um, I'm going to go ahead and field a question from chat because it's, it's very relevant and, uh, to, to this evening, um, real quick. Um, sure. And so uh, my buddy Jay Fritz asked, he says, uh, did Mr. Munns ever see that part of the film you presented us, Pat, where she walks away in her large backside? So I think you know what I'm talking about. And I did send that clip to you uh, today that, yes. that uh, my buddy uh, Brendan. And so real quick, before we get to that, I have to acknowledge uh it's because of Brendan from uh, Catskill Appalachian uh, Research uh, that uh, that we're able to have this conversation. He is he's provided the um, infrastructure and production so that I could have you on tonight because of the technical issues that I was having. Um, so to acknowledge uh, Brendan, uh, Brendan is actually here. He is facilitating this conversation. He could actually jump in and start talking anytime he wanted to. Uh, so yes, I did send that clip to him. And what was your opinion of that, Bill? Oh, um, yeah. What you're talking about is uh, after the look back, she goes and she's walking away behind some trees. And Roger shoots for a while, but the trees are in the way. And finally, she clears the trees, and she is walking literally straight away from camera. So we have a perfect uh, outline of her head, her shoulders, her back, uh, hip area, legs and such, and her arms. And we have a perfect set of proportions looking straight at her back, whereas in the earlier film, we're looking at her in kind of an angle. 
So, yeah, that sequence is very, very valuable in terms of analysis when we're looking at the proportion of her anatomy from the direct back looking on the body, uh, whereas as compared to the angular views that we get on the other side. So that particular segment, it's from about frame 600 to maybe 680 or so, something in that range. Um, very, very valuable sequence for helping us analyze that. Yes, definitely. Right. And so the the clipping it, so the at the the uh stabilization clip that i was referring to you know uh, that brendan did it does seem that it was compressed that he did uh, like not intentionally he didn't intentionally compress it but you know where where he got it from and then the process he used to stabilize it and all that so it it did become compressed and that was your opinion of it yes uh, yeah, um, when you try to do a frame grab from a video, some programs will allow you to do the frame grab, but when they do it, for some reason, they stretch out the image horizontally. I encountered that when I was uh, pulling frames off of a DVD video of uh, the first reel of Roger's theatrical reel that he had, was showing around uh, the country in the late 1960s uh, when he went on tour uh, to tell people about the film. Uh, mm -hmm. I was pulling individual frames out of that DVD of the, uh, the first reel of his theatrical uh, film. And they did exactly that. The frame grabs stretched horizontally. And I had to actually go back and then reprocess them, shrinking them horizontally back to their correct aspect ratio. So that horizontal stretch is actually a common I result see. of some frame grab technology when you're taking it from uh, video on DVD. So, yeah, it can happen. Well, so I brought it up here. Uh, let's see if I can get back. Okay. And and that's all fair. Um, so here's the difference. I'm I'm bringing it up just so you know, Bill. I'm bringing it up on screen right now for visually for the audience. Okay. Uh, and and you can see the compression, uh, which is fine. She's still big as hell. <laughs> it's like, like even with that, like I get that. Um, God, that thing's huge, man. Like, oh yeah, uh, she is. I just, uh, I just can't get over how big she was. Um, but oh, there, yeah. there's the example. Um, and uh, I'll go ahead and get rid of that. Although, here's the other thing I wanted to ask you about because. If there's one thing that I, I think it's the color correction that ended up being the most important thing that uh, Brendan did with this, with this, uh, you know, the way he stabilized it and, you know, did what he he did to it after, you know, clipping it off wherever he got it. Right. To me, it's the colorization uh, that is the most important because what I see going on here with Patty and you can see it in other parts of the film. And so I'm just going to throw that. I'm just going to throw it out there to you, Bill, and kind of see what you have to say or what you think is uh pillow erection. Does that mean anything to you? What? Pilo erection? Yes. Pilo erection? Yes. Yeah. Pilo it's erection. happening on the back of her neck. It's actually happening on the back of her neck, which is a, fear response. Uh, we see it, of course, dogs have it, but humans to some extent have it, and other primates do as well, where hair will stand up on end, because each hair um, follicle actually has a small erector muscle and can actually stand up, um, and usually occurs under situations of stress, fear, tension, um, shock, surprise, and such like that. 
Um, I mean, we even have a phrase for it where we talk about such and such raised, you know, the hair on the back of my neck. Um, that's exactly the same process. Uh, so it does occur, and it actually is occurring on her, which is why in her her neck, when we see her from behind, the area of the neck is almost pure black, yet the area of the fur is a much lighter tone. Um, when hair stands up on end, sunlight uh, goes down in between the hairs and kind of disappears. When hair is laying down flat, it's easier for the sunlight to reflect off of it. So hair laid down flat is going to be lighter. Hair that is erected up is going to be darker. And it's exactly dark on the back of her neck, exactly where this pilo or pilo erection would occur on a primate who is frightened, scared, or uh, stressed in some way. Uh, as we might assume that Patty would be trying to get away from these strange creatures that just invaded her world. Yeah. Well, Bill, what I see in, um, in, so what Brendan did, and I, again, I think it's the color correction more than anything else. So let's just kind of forget the width of everything. Like that could be fixed. Right. Um, obviously yeah, right um especially given your you, you providing the actual scale you know um brendan can fix that and i'm sorry but yeah. what struck me from his his uh version of stabilizing that color correcting it it that was the first time that i recognized the the um pilo cor- Pilo erection. Um, what I see is it looks exactly like my dog. It, 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 I'm not going down a dog man road here. I'm just saying it goes. It, it goes from the neck no, so ne- down the spine to the small of the back. Uh-huh. And and to me, yeah. it is it's uh-huh. clear as it can be. It is erect. That hair is erect. That is not a differentiating, like in hair thickness or anything weird like that. I mean, obviously, it was like the sun was shining straight down. Uh, it was, you know, what mm-hmm. between twelve thirty and one thirty in the afternoon when it was filmed. Yeah, uh, right. I see that hair standing up on the back of that thing, like I see on the back of my dog. When she gets alerted to something, I see the exact same pattern. I can't, that can't be a coincidence. Yeah. That cannot be a coincidence. No, it's not. It's not. So, yeah, that's, that's why I wanted to, yeah, I just wanted to bring that up and, you know, say, look, it, it, the, that was the most important thing that ever came out of, uh, of, of Brendan, uh, doing what he did with that part of the film oh, you're much that, too it kind. opened my eyes hey, hey behead what's up you're much, i've been listening you're much too kind okay well, you're you're welcome to the join the conversation you're facilitating uh, no i like to sit back and listen you guys do it's a great show well, cool man um but yeah that was like to me for me to see that and immediately recognize the hair standing up at the back like from her neck to her 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 glutes man like that was mind blowing. I'm like, this is new evidence. Like I was, I got all excited, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so yeah, I wanted to address that real quick. Um, sure. So yeah, let's. Um, I don't know. I guess we can start wrapping it up, Bill. Um, here's my thought. Like, if we're gonna go anywhere with the PG film. All right, so what do you think about this? I'm just going to throw it at you, okay? Okay. I'm sure you. I'm sure you're familiar with Greg Nicotero. Um. Yeah, he's a makeup effects artist. Yeah, yeah, and he's. I think he was part of a company called KMB. Sure. Yeah. He is. He is IDBM credentials like out the yin yang, and he's been. 
Uh, yep. it, like he he created the whole genre of, of zombies for The Walking Dead, you know, all the walkers. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. Right. I, I, I worked I worked with Greg. Uh, I was one of his walkers on that show. Um, so he's to me like Greg's world class. And yeah. If there's anybody in this world that I would pick and say, all right recreate the pg film it would be him like and i'm talking boots on the ground obviously you know boots on the ground special effects you know no no cgi or anything like that uh right Mm -hmm. and i'm wondering if he could pull it off it you know if if he was challenged to do that it if he could even pull it off you know well, if he was restricted to materials known to be in the practice in 1967, um, he would be very severely constrained. Materials today are a lot better, more capable of such. But there's a few things, irrespective of the materials, uh, that would not be able to be pulled off. And one of them, like I mentioned before, is the shape and size of the head. Um Finding a person with the correct body proportions, long torso, long arms, short legs, would be very, very difficult to find anybody close to that uh, who's of any substantial height. Um, Those would be difficult. Uh, A lot of the issues with the fur would be difficult. Uh, The fluid motion of the breast, if you were restricted to materials from 1967, would be impossible. Uh, if you worked with non-stretch fur, which is what was available in 67, you could not replicate the stretching of the fur on the leg as the leg moves, uh, contracting back at the knee, stretching forward to step, uh, with each step forward. There's a stretching and compressing of the fur on the leg, which, oh, a fur cloth at the time couldn't do. So basically, um, Neither he nor anybody else in the business could do what Patty is if they were honestly working with only materials that certifiably were available in 1967. Wouldn't happen. You know, I'd almost be willing to, uh, just for the sake of hell, entertainment, let's just say, let him use all modern day materials. Like, I'd be willing to to for him to take that challenge even using modern day material mm-hmm. so do you think that would be much of a game changer <laughs> um just out of curiosity who's going to pay for it um, it wouldn't be cheap yeah the even production. to attempt it it would it would not be cheap Obviously, this would be documented. It would be there would be a production company involved. Um, so yeah. let's just hypothetically, need, yeah, yeah. I know it's hypothetical, but you do have to address that reality. As soon as you want to go beyond the hypothetical, anywhere near reality, that's literally the first question that comes up: Who's paying for it? Because it won't be cheap, and especially anyone who really is on a high level, and Greg certainly is. Uh, yeah. Anyone on a high level uh, is not going to do it on spec. They're not going to do it for a pittance or just for, you know, I'll pay for the materials. No, no, it's it's going to cost. Uh, so no, I know. any I question know. about even wanting to do this, the, the question of sponsorship would factor very heavily into it. Yeah. Sure. But again, let's just say, let's just say that Greg's like, ah, whatever, I'll take. I'll take that challenge, <laughs> you know. Uh, okay, fine. Then, uh, hypothetically, using modern day materials, you th- you think you could pull it off? I'm I'm just curious. Well, you can pull off the stretch fur. Mm-hmm. Modern spandex based fur cloths can do a lot of what we see in body that the old 60s, 1967 fur cloth could not do. Yeah, so. Modern fur could do what the fur does. The motion in the breasts, 
some of the modern BJB resins that are being used and the silicone resins that are used for flab and fat body suits and such, they could produce a fluid motion of the breast mass like we see in the film, but 1967 materials couldn't. So modern materials could solve that, but no modern material is going to solve the problem of the very small head that is not human in its basic head form. Uh, nobody be able to solve that one with modern materials, old materials, any materials. Uh, that would be the biggest challenge to trying to create anything accurate. Okay. And probably could not be surmounted even today with today's technology. All right. Fair enough. That, yeah, I, I asked the question uh, because it's, it's interesting to me. It's uh I'm trying to pull that off. I'm trying. I'm trying to pull this off, and uh, if I do for some reason, I w- I will 100% involve you, Bill. So, sure, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, uh, 100% involve you, and uh, it, I think. I mean, for me, it would be a fascinating uh, experiment. And uh, dude, Greg would be up for it. Like uh, we talk about the cost, and I know we, I know what you were talking about with that. It's like, well, it's his time, you know. And Greg's a busy guy, uh, but he does have a right. he. He has his own studio, so you know, like they're all professionals in his his studio there, right? And uh, sure. you know. So it, it could be left in their hands, and Greg, you know, Greg could be a part of it when he needs to be, if you follow me. Uh, yeah, sure. But regardless, dude, he's he's a talented guy, and it, there's nobody in the world I, I I wouldn't pick first other than Greg to go. Because, again, I mean, I worked under Greg. Like, I know his talent. Like, it's, like, he's a cool guy, right? You know? And, uh. So yeah, I I think it would be an interesting thing, and of course it would have to be documented. Like I mean, the entertainment value alone is off the charts. Uh, oh yeah, and, absolutely. And I want to see what happens at the end if he can pull it off or not. You know. So. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. Yep. Just thought, just thought I'd, I'd love to see it done. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Just, just thought I'd throw it out there. Um, yeah, I'd love to see it done. Well, what else do you got, man? Like, uh, we're gonna wrap it up. So, um, anything you want to close with? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll try and take a couple of questions if they pop up, guys, uh, guys and gals. Uh, now's the time for questions. Uh, sorry, I couldn't get to them earlier. Yeah, I can't think of anything. I think we've covered everything very, very well. But yeah, I'll be glad to take any questions that might pop up. No problem. Yeah, they might. They might not. Um, chat chat's a little fickle sometimes. Um, but any anything you want to close with? Uh, would I mean? In, is there anything you got coming up or other things you've done recently you want to address? I know, like the uh, when- no. Well, there's a lot of other activity that I'm doing, but it's not related to this in any way. So probably not worth bringing up. Do you? Oh, um, yeah. Um, there's a TV program called Expedition Bigfoot. I think it's on Travel Channel. Uh, yes, um, it is. I, I did the did the show a few weeks back. The episode will be coming up sometime soon, maybe in the next few months. Okay. Where I and one of the the host principals, Bryce, uh, he and I sat down together and do a really comprehensive analysis. Um. So anyone who's interested, you might kind of watch out for the Expedition Bigfoot program and um, see when they announce one where they're doing particularly uh, special uh, <laughs> program on the Patterson film. Uh, so that was that was their guest on that. Okay, so that did involve your appearance on that show involved the PG film. Yes. Okay. Correct. Good. Yeah. Uh, I do have one question um, uh, is to ask, uh, ask Bill what he thinks of the rupture in the leg. Uh, I think you're talking about the herniated. 
the herniated that people yeah, talk about. It. Yeah, thigh muscle. Is that what the person's referring to? Yes, correct. Probably. Mm -hmm. um, that actually is something called copy bloom. Mm -hmm. When you copy film, mm -hmm. the contrast goes up, so the light gets lighter, the dark gets darker. And after a while, light gets up to white, and it can't get any lighter. Um, then the surrounding area that's not quite pure white gets pure white. And the, the structure blooms or gets larger. Uh, when film is copied several times, mm. uh, that area of the leg, unfortunately, is uh, a result of copy bloom occurring uh, from copies that have been copied over multiple times. And there's a highlight on the thigh that has bloomed up into something much bigger. Um, what I did is I went through my entire archives and I've got scans from like 20 different copies of the film. Uh, and some of them are full frame, zoomed in, slow motion, freeze frame, everything. And compared that part of the leg on all these different copies and found that in the copies that didn't have any copy bloom on them, uh, there wasn't that same bulge. But on the copies where there was copy bloom from the building up of contrast, it was much more prominent. So I concluded that that's actually an anomaly of the film copy process. It's not something anatomical on Patty's leg. Interesting. Yeah. I've never I've never heard that before. I've never I've never heard you say that before. Um, that's because most people don't know enough about film. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah no, it, yeah, it, that, it, that, that's why you have to analyze the film from a standpoint of a filmmaker who understands photography and film and processing and copying and yep. all and the artifacts that can build up in copies. That's why that's important. And that's, that's why we need a thousand more of you, Bill, in like, in all kinds <laughs> of categories, like not just, you know, yeah. film analysis. Um, I do have another question for you. Um, uh, Patrick Vaughn says, to, to you, Bill, in your experience, what one thing do you find compelling for or against the existence of Bigfoot? Well, okay, I only really have any expertise on the Patterson film. All the rest of the stuff, the footprints, the trackways, um, the stick structures, <clears throat> sound recordings, all that stuff. Um, I don't really have any particular expertise in all of those areas. Um, I know for a fact the Patterson film is absolutely real and authentic, so that alone makes it the most compelling single piece of evidence. But other things that do intrigue me very much are some of the stick structures that I have seen. I've actually been out in the woods. I've seen them myself, as well as seen pictures of them. Um, and in all the footprint casts, I know there's a lot of fake footprints out there. There's no question people trying to hoax researchers. But I've seen a few footprint casts that I am 100% confident are absolutely real. They were made with an organic foot pressed into the ground, not by somebody stamping something or sculpting something or anything like that. So I've actually seen a few footprints where the moment I saw them, I said, that's real. That is not a fake. That was not stamped in, sculpted out in the ground or any other way of fabricating. Uh, so those are elements that also give me a strong level of confidence that there really is something out there, aside from the Patterson film. Interesting. The most interesting about thing about what you just said is that you pretty much stay to your lane. Um, you're you're willing to opine about things outside your expertise, but you just admitted you you stay in your lane. I like that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a big enough field that realistically one person can't really cover it all, and so specialists in certain areas really are better left staying in their specialty. And my specialty happens to be the, the photographic analysis of the Patterson film. 
So I, I do generally try to stay within that realm. Yeah. Sure. No, I, I, I get that. I totally, I understand that like in a very, uh, I don't know, professional way I'll say with you, Bill. Um, yeah. Cause I, I, I'm the same kind of thinking. It's like, my my lane is my lane. My expertise is my expertise. To go outside of that, I'm just opining, you know, like, which yeah. I do. I, I'm okay. Like, I have a show here, so I can opine on my show. But when it comes to being out there in the woods and dealing with them, there's no opining. It is like, you are who you yeah. are. You're doing what you're doing, you know, kind of thing. Right. Yeah. yeah. So. Sure. Um. So I appreciate that. I appreciate that in you. I really do. Um, I, I, you know, just, I mean, again, to wrap it up, man, like I appreciate the fact that you came into this subject as objectively as you could. It seems like, you know, I mean, that's, that's yeah, definitely the story you're telling. Like, you know, uh, we, you know, you and I haven't been BFFs for 30 years or anything. Um, so I believe you when you say that, and and you had a professional skill set to add to the conversation, which you've clearly right. you've done, you know, like um, mm-hmm. you've made that impact. Um, and for that, I I totally appreciate you. Again, I wish I could get a thousand more of you, man. Like I, <laughs> I'm not kidding. Like everything from DNA. Well, to film when they figure out how to clone people, I'll run off a few more copies of myself. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. But yeah, I'm not even just talking about the 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 sort of film special effects thing, like from DNA to photography mm-hmm. to you you know you name it trackers, uh, Navy SEALs, yeah. like whatever it is, dude. I wish I could get a thousand more professionals looking into this subject than exists now. Does that make sense? Yeah, it would be nice. Definitely. Yeah. Well, I'm trying sure. to build that I'm trying to build that coalition. <laughs> so good. Yeah. Excellent uh, endeavor. Well thank you. Uh and hopefully God, hopefully Bill will get somewhere soon, man. Like you know, hopefully we'll get somewhere soon. Sounds I'm, good. I'm I, I'm right there. I'm right there with you, Ben, with the PG film. Uh, it is what it is, you know. And it's not what it's not. And uh, yeah. And you know that story is worth telling. Like it's still worth telling that story. It's still worth putting that narrative out there. In that understanding, in that evidence, you know. Uh, but yep. at some point, we have to pivot. We got to, we, we need PG times 10. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah, sure. We need five minutes of footage. We need, well, you're going to have to because with this, you know, this day and age with computers and CGI, it's, it's tough. You know, to get what is yeah. legitimate anymore? You know, I agree. Metadata. Yeah, it's trickier now because faking is easier. Oh yeah, unfortunately, it is. Yeah. But if you if you provide the original SD card metadata that clearly shows that there's no insertion of software, that the camera saw what it saw, so you can be yeah. Definitely getting back to the original material is always the yeah. best way to try to clear up any issue of faking it. Absolutely. Exactly. So if you film a Bigfoot and it's amazing, it's compelling, it's like five times better than the PG film, you have that on an SD card, you have to be willing to share that metadata with anyone and and show that it's, hey, this is what the camera saw. There ain't no CGI programming in here. Well, yeah, that's frustrating. Yeah. It's it's, yeah. it's it's very frustrating because you see a lot of people that claim there's a lot of groups that claim to have evidence, but it, without presenting it like like to to 
people like Bill and to people that, that can look at it. It's just a story, right? There's no evidence yeah. there until you bring forth uh, all all the stuff that you have and, and level the playing field and let everybody look at it. Yep. Yeah. Transparency is very important. And um, it's hard to come by in this in this community. Yeah. I agree. Well, gentlemen, I think uh, we're about two hours into this. I think I'm going to have to kind of wrap it up if you don't mind. Yeah, I got to jump too, so I got to take my phone line. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to. Um, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm going to wrap up the show. We're going to go ahead and wrap up now. I'm going to end the broadcast. It'll be a hard ending. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Thank you so much, Bill, for being here. I appreciate you. And, of course, Brendan, My thank pleasure. you. Thank you for being the producer tonight. It was an honor. It was a great show. Bill, thanks. Thank you. Very pleasure yeah. to meet you. And You're uh, very welcome, sir. And we will, uh, you know, hey, we'll pick this conversation back up whenever it's appropriate. But thanks, everybody, for being here. I'm going to go ahead and end the show. Thanks for watching. Everybody have a good night.